Uh, hello, I'm Alex Basson. I teach the graduate course in counseling offenders at the Florida State University School of Criminology. In response to Larry Wallen's invitation to have more graduate students involved in the 88th version of the Southern Conference on Corrections, we had a discussion about it in class, and we came up with the wonderful idea of presenting a certain number of problems by Marino's uh, invention of role playing. But then it developed that at least two of our members might not be here because of graduation, and uh, Joe White, who has a background in media, suggested that perhaps we could have it done on tape, on videotape. And uh, I'll leave out a few of the intervening steps, uh, but it ended up with Joel approaching our very generous dean, Gordon Waldo, and prevailing on him to underwrite this enterprise. In short, what we're going to do is to present three problems that might possibly occur in the course of counseling offenders. And we're going to come up with uh, uh, the solution that the students have arrived at. Frankly, I don't know exactly what they're going to present, but we can have a session afterwards and go through a critique. I do want to introduce you to the uh, people that are going to be uh, directly involved in order, Gail Miracle, Cortha McMillan, Mike Netherland, Keith Southwood, Michelle Taylor, and last but not least, Joel White. Uh, I'm going to introduce the content of each of the sessions as they were presented to the student to be, re be resolved. But without further talk, let's get into the business of our presentation. Thank you. The first case we call the case of the home drinker, and it involves Mike Netherland and Keith Southward, and it was presented to the students as follows. Keith is a 25-year-old parolee serving the remainder of a two-year sentence for striking his wife with an axe handle while he was intoxicated. He tells you he would like to have permission to occasionally take a drink of Southern Comfort or some other alcoholic beverage in the privacy of his home. His wife would not object, he says, and his previous PO indicated it would be okay. We are asking you to demonstrate this situation in a 15 minute or less office interview. You're on your own. Hi, Keith. How you doing? How you doing, Mr. Dunn? I'm nice doing fine. You. How's the job going? Very well, very well. Getting along pretty good with your boss and everything? Yes, I am. That's good. He's good. treating me pretty good. That's good. Um, what'd you need to see me about? Well, Mr. Nedlin, I got this thing I'd like to talk to you about. I was wondering if it would be all right with you, since I had a talk with my old probation officer and my wife, I was wondering if it would be all right if I had a drink of alcohol every now and then in, in the privacy of my own home after I get off of work. When did you ask your probation officer this question? I talked to him about two months ago. And you're just now bringing it up. Why didn't you bring it up last time we met? Well, you know, that was only the second or third time that we had met, and I didn't know you very well, and I guess I was just a little bit nervous, you know, since I hadn't met you before. Well, I can understand that. Um, frankly, I can't allow you to have a drink. You can't? No, it is illegal. I could lose my job. If you're caught drinking, then I would have to send you back to prison. I'd have to violate your parole. You have to send me back to prison. I don't want to go back to prison. I understand. I don't blame you, and I don't want you to go back to prison either. Well, I don't see what the big deal is. You know, it's only a couple drinks, and I wouldn't be like, driving my car around. And I'd just be at home at night after work and stuff like that. You know. I understand, but you're you. I've looked at your file here, and you hit your wife with an axe handle while you were drunk. Yeah, but you know how and that went. I that's mean, what you, you went to prison for. It was only one night, and it was I just lost my temper one time, and I'm not usually like that. You know how it was. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, you'd been drinking heavily all week. Yes, sir. You had been drinking God knows how long before that, and I think you had a problem. 
Well, you know, maybe I did. I, I guess you're right. I, I, I did have a little bit of a drinking problem back then, but that was two years ago, you know, and I've served my time. But I guess there's no way you'll change your mind, huh? No, there's not. I can't. It's illegal. And like I say, I could lose my job and I have to send you back to prison. Yeah. Well, I don't want to go back to prison. Well, what do you think about maybe uh, going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting? Alcoholics Anonymous? What is that? Well, it's a uh, group of people that meet several times a week mm -hmm. throughout the year. Um, they all have basically the same problems. Yeah. Was this a uh, church group? Or? Al no, it's not a church group. Oh. It's, uh, it's a group of people who have had problems with drinking in the past. They get together. They talk about their problems. It's a self-help sort of thing. Yeah. And there's a bunch of people there that have had problems with drinking and stuff like me, huh? Right. I got a friend of mine that uh, he's a lawyer. Uh huh. Believe it or not, he's a lawyer, and uh, he's had problems with alcohol. Yeah. And he started going to these Alcoholics Anonymous meetings about, oh, I guess, about a year ago. And since that time, he has not had a drink. And he started going a year ago. When was the last time he had a drink? Well, he didn't. I mean, he, has, he hasn't had a drink since since he started going to the meetings. And I think it would be a good idea if you went. Yeah? Hmm. Well, that's something to think about, you know. Um, if I did go, though, what would it be in, in it for me? I mean, what could I get out of it? Well, this is what I'll do. What I want you to do is go to at least one alcoholics meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting for a week for a period of one year. Uh-huh. Oh. How's that sound? And what I'll do, if you do that, right, is I'll go before the parole board and I'll recommend that your parole be reduced by at least six months. Six months. What do you think? That sounds pretty good. But I, what happens if I miss a meeting? Well, like I said, I have a friend there. He has several friends. And I'm going to call him and let him know you're coming. Uh -huh. And if you do miss a meeting, I want you to call me. You know, uh -huh. If there's an emergency, I can understand it. But I want you to call me. Yes, sir. And let me know why you can't attend this meeting. Uh -huh. well, I can probably do that. You know? I'm going to know if you don't go, frankly. Yeah. For a year, you want me to go once a week? once a week and I'll go before the parole board. What if I just don't like it at all? I mean, totally don't like it. Doesn't well, matter. Well, I'm hoping that you will. Yeah. Okay. Well, how can I guarantee that you'll go to in front of the parole board and talk to him for me? Well, we can write up an agreement. How's that sound to you? Like a contract. A contract. Now, you're under union contract to work for your construction company. Mm -hmm. You know what a contract is? Sure do. And we'll both sign it and stick to our ends of the bargain. You can guarantee me six months? I can't guarantee it, but I will recommend it at least six months to the parole board if you go to these meetings. Uh-huh. I go once a week and call you if I can't make it, but try to make it, right? Yes. I could probably, I could probably do that. Okay. Let me uh, get some paper here and we'll write up an agreement and okay. we'll go sign it. All right. Okay, this is what I'm going to write. Okay. I, Robert, will attend at least one Alcoholics meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, mm -hmm. a week for a period of one year. Right. If I do so, Mr. Netherland, uh -huh. We'll go before the parole board and recommend that my parole be reduced by at least six months. Right. Does that well, sound okay? Yeah, that sounds all right. That's a pretty good deal. I mean, as long as you hold up your end of the bargain, I can probably hold up my end. No, that's why we're writing out this agreement. We'll uh -huh. have this a year from now. Okay. Okay, I'm going to sign it. All right. Okay, I want you to sign it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put it in your file, 
and we'll see at the end of the year how things go. All right. But in the meantime, I'll see you in about two weeks. About two weeks. Regular, okay. regular time, right? Right. All right. Good seeing you, Keith. Okay, Mr. Nolan. We call the next case, I'm going to commit suicide, and it involves Cawthon McMillan and Joel White, and it reads as follows. Your parolee tells you he has been feeling very depressed during the period since, since his last report, and he has been entertaining suicidal ideas. How would you handle this situation in the course of a 15 minute or so office interview? Good morning, JB. How are you doing? Um, I don't know. Well, what's wrong? How has, it's been a month since I've seen you now. What's been going on in your life for the past month? It's been rough, Miss McMillan. It's been rough. Well, tell me, explain to me what's been happening. It hasn't been any happening. Well, I know it's been quite a while, it's been about, like I said, a month since we last met, but at the last meeting we were, seemed to be on a positive note. Everything seemed to be looking up. We had made a plan and we were going to work with it and stick with that plan and you seemed really positive about your life at that particular time. What's happened in this past month? What's happened? What's been going on? Uh... What hasn't happened? You know, whoever made that saying, if it ain't one thing, it's another. They, they were right, you know. Well, J.B., now, looking back through my files here, I find in your folder here, I see that we had the plan we had made, we had a two-part plan. And, well, the first part of that plan was for you to, to work harder with finding a job. Well, how, does, how has that gone? I still ain't got no job. Well, have you been looking? Yeah. Well, okay, you say you've been looking. How often have you been gone out and looked for a job in the past month? Well, you talk about that plan. I remember that plan. You know, it don't seem to be doing me no good now. Oh, but JB, okay, in the past month, how many times have you gone to look for a job? How many times have you pounded the pavement in the past month? Well... You know that first week? Now that first week, hey, I was excited. Got me a plan. I'm going to show them. Right. I went out there, I knocked on God knows how many doors, and most of the time I didn't even get a chance to fill out an application. Hey, shoot. Well, okay. What about the second week? Did you go out and look for a job the second week? I didn't feel it right that second week. You know, after a week of that, hey. There just was no hope to me, you know. So you haven't been looking for a job in the past three weeks? Only that first week you looked for a job? No, I looked for a job all the way through, but shoot, man, it can only take so much. But you just really pounded the pavement the first week. Well, it takes longer than a week to find a job, baby. You have to be hard working. I mean, you have to work hard at finding a job. You have to have a lot of, put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, and it's obvious that you haven't been doing that. Okay, well, let's look at the second part of our plan. That was for you to go and get involved with the uh, local YMCA to, to uh, like we said, to expand your horizons, to make you feel better about yourself, give you some outside involvement. Well, have you gone down there? Have you worked with them? Are you teaching tennis down there now? No, it didn't work out neither. Well, what happened? Same old, same old happened. Well, tell me what happened. I mean, did you go down there? Did you go to the YMCA? Yeah, I went down there. Well, what happened when you went down there? Well, I don't know. You know, hey, like I said, things just don't work right for me. Now, I went down there, all right? But before I got there, the alarm clock didn't work that morning I was supposed to go there. So I got up late. That's strike one. 
went to take my shower, the hot water wasn't working, I had to take a bird bath because I can't take no cold showers. That's strike two. Fix my breakfast. You know, I like to have some oatmeal or something in the morning. The oatmeal, I don't know, somehow I got distracted. The oatmeal boiled over the pot, burned on the stove. That's strike three. Not eight. It's like they say in baseball, right? Three strikes, you out. Okay. So now, I still went down there. I still went down there, but... Okay, you still haven't told me what happened once you got there. So you were late for the, the interview that morning. Yeah, about 30 minutes, I guess. 30 minutes late. Now see, that put a bad blimp on you there, being late. Well, okay, well, what else happened when you got, once you finally got there, what happened? Well, they didn't like the way I was dressed, you know? I'm going down there to try and get a job uh, teaching tennis. So, hey, I go in my sweatshirt and my short pants. I'm ready to show them what I can do teaching tennis. They didn't like that. Okay, so you said that they didn't like the way you were dressed, but remember we had decided that when you did go for this interview, you were going to uh, wear your nicest pair of dress pants, your nicest dress shirt, and a tie to make you look more professional, to give you a you know, an air of success that you wanted this position, that you wanted to you wanted to work with these kids. Why didn't you do that? Well, hey, I don't know. I wasn't feeling right. Okay. So you were late, first of all. You weren't dressed correctly, second of all. What type of attitude did you have? Would, well, how did they react to you once you got there? What type of attitude would you have had after the day, the morning that I had? Huh? So you went in there with this cocky attitude. Well, you know, I have a skill. They have a need. I told them, you know, hey, the way I saw it, you know? Okay, JB. Now I understand that you have something for them. You have a you have a skill that you want to teach them. But also they have something to offer you. They have a chance to offer you a better life and getting your life better together. And you, now, you know, that's something, that's something I've been thinking about, you know, um, my life, you know, this plan and you know, all, it just don't work. And I understand I made some mistakes, you know, that's, that's the way I've been doing all my life. Things just don't work for me. To, to, I can't explain it, you know. All week, all week I've been waking up in the morning, you know, funny thoughts running through my head and, you know, I don't well, Debbie, know. Listen. We had this plan, and obviously it didn't work. So our next step is to uh, set up another plan, a plan that will better suit your needs, one that's less uh, aggressive for you, one that'll fit you better. So um, let's work on doing that because you've got to, you've got to, it seemed like I said you, you had this plan together and you had all these problems, so you seem to think, but your level of commitment was very low, and that's something in your life and with trying to work and do anything, your level of commitment's got to be high, because the first thing, well, responsibility, you've got to have responsibility, and you haven't shown me any responsibility here, and the first thing you've got to remember is the ability, responsibility is the ability to fulfill your needs, and to do them in a way that doesn't deprive others of theirs. And you haven't been considerate of others. All you've been thinking of is yourself. So I think we need to work on a new plan. See, that's what I'm trying to say. I've been through this plan, plan A, plan B, plan Z, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if these plans are for me, you know. Like I said, all week I had these funny feelings. Today I woke up and I asked myself, you know, what do I have to live for? And, and I don't think I have, you know, I, I, now there is something I think I can do, something that I think I can do right, put a halt to all this, you know, I think I can go out and just, hey, I can just, you know, hey, I can, I can commit suicide, you know, I can put a halt to all this because I don't have anything to live for, you know? You can do what? I, I just don't know if. You know, life isn't worth living to me. You know, it doesn't seem like it's worth living. JB, listen, 
your life, you are not giving yourself a chance. You obviously have some problems, and we understand that. But committing suicide is not the answer. So I think what you and I need to do right now is uh, just, we need to go talk to my supervisor, and we need to tell him what your plans are, what you've decided to do with yourself. So come on, let's go see my supervisor now. Let's go. Uh, no problem. Last but not least, we have the case of the distraught mother, which involves Michelle Taylor and Gail Miracle. And the situation is about like this. A very angry woman comes to your office and demands to see you about your 38-year-old parolee, who she claims has been fooling around with her 16-year-old daughter. She is extremely angry, and she says that unless you forbid this relationship, She's going to see the governor. She's going to write a letter to the uh, Tallahassee Democrat. You'll hear a lot from her unless something is done. We asked the student to show us how uh, she would handle it. So how long are you going to be at work? Okay. Well, I'm going to be here till around 5. 4 o'clock? That sounds good. So you still enjoy it? Well, that's great. That's great. Okay, so I'll see you at 4. Okay. Bye-bye. So, Miss Willard, how can I help you today? I ain't here to do no socializing. I'm here to talk to you about something serious. Okay, something serious? Tell me a little bit about this serious matter. First, you tell me something. You're supposed to be the parole officer of Jim Bates? Yes, Jim is my parolee. Then I want to know why you are not doing your job. Okay, not doing my job? What do you mean by not doing my job? You ain't controlling that boy like you're supposed to be. Controlling him? Controlling him how? Controlling him like keeping him away from my daughter. That's how. Your daughter? Uh, what's your daughter's name? Cynthia. Cynthia? Cindy Ann. Uh, Cindy Ann. Oh, yes. He's told me about Cindy Ann. He's quite fond of her. Oh, well, I don't doubt that. I bet I have caught them out on the front porch of my house, like kissing and all that good stuff, and I don't like it. She ain't got no business being out with no 38-year-old mutt. She's only 16 years old. You're going to have to do something about this. 16 years old? If I'm not mistaken, Jim told me she was 19 years old. Well, did you ever think that boy might be lying to you? My daughter is 16 years old. She's just a little girl. Okay, now there's a possibility that Jim could possibly be telling me an untruth. But if that's the case, then I need to have some facts about this. You want some facts? I'll give you some facts. You know where he's been taking my daughter? No. Do you have any idea where he might be taking her? No. He's taking her down to a bar. He's taking her to a bar where people are drinking. Do you know Harry's Wine and Liquors? Okay, that's on 5th Street. Do you know what they do there? No, what do they do? They sell drugs. That's what they do there. And then they got them women there. You know the kind of women, I'm not going to say the exact word, well, I could say they are, but you know them uh, ladies of the evening types? They're out there showing off their bodies and rubbing up against people and just all the sorts of things I don't want my daughter seeing. And he's taking her there every afternoon on the back of that motorcycle of his. Okay, Miss Wheeler, let me make sure I'm getting this information correctly. Okay, first of all, your daughter is 16 years old, which yes. means she's a minor. That's right. Okay. And he's taking her to bars? He's taking her to bars, hanging out with that kind of trash he is. He's going to ruin her life just like he did that man he threw battery acid on. Okay. And when he's taking her to bars, is this just more than one, or is it just Harry's Wine and Liquor, or...? He's taking her to Black Road Terrace. He's taking her to Harry's Wine and Liquor. He's taking her down to Smokey's. Down to Smokey's? Okay, now that I remember, he told me he met her at Smokey's, so obviously <sighs> she told him that she was 19. My daughter wouldn't do that. She is not that kind of a girl. Okay. She does not hang out at bars. She don't hang around with these people. And she's only 16. Now, how long has he been away, anyhow? Um, three years. It's been well, if he met years. her down at Smokey's before he went away, then she'd have been 13 years old. Now, how can you believe something like that? Well, now that you tell me, this is a very serious matter. Damn and right. I'm going to have to do some investigating. Yes. Because this is, this is definitely a... Uh, a violation of his parole, and this could be very serious trouble for Jim. So, okay, I need your help. So I want you to tell me again some of the facts. I'm writing them down 
so that I can start investigating and know exactly what to do. What more do you need to know? I have told you he's hanging out with little girls. He's hanging out with my daughter, and she's not the only one I think he's messing around with. I saw him with another little girl on the back of his motorcycle just the other day. Okay, describe this little girl on the back of his motorcycle. Oh, she's, you know, about... She's skinny. she got kind of curly, kinky brown hair. She looks like she ain't eaten a week. She ain't been fed well. She's just that thin. Okay, the reason why I'm asking is because Jim called me the other day and asked could he go and pick up his daughter. He's been married, married before, and he has a daughter who's 15 years old, and she is somewhat like you described. So it could have been his daughter. Did you talk to him about it? No, I didn't talk to him. I try not ever to talk to him. I don't like the man. I don't want the man around. The man is pure scum. Okay, so Miss Willie, are you telling me you've never talked to Jim? No, no, that is not true. I did talk to him once. I did. I did talk to him once. I told him to stay away from my house, stay away from my daughter. Don't be writing her them mushy, mushy letters that give her ideas about things she ain't never had ideas about before. I tell you what, I think they're, uh, they're doing things, you know. So you're telling me that you think that they're intimate? Intimate? Hell, I think they're screwing. Okay, Miss Willer, if that's the case, this this is just, it's too serious, okay? She's a minor. You're yeah. saying that they're intimate. That's another violation. You're saying he's taking her to bars? Yes. Okay, these are very serious matters, and I want you to help me, okay? So I want to investigate this. So I'm going to write all of this down, but I'm not going to say anything to Jim about it. We have an appointment today at 4 o'clock, and I'm just going to ask him, you know, just my basic things, what he's been doing, and et cetera. Okay. And I want to see what he's going to say about the matter. Well, he'll lie to you. You know he's going to lie to you. Well, I don't know. I hope Jim is honest with me. Up to this point, he's been honest, and I, I would have never known this young lady was nine, well, 16, and he told me she was 19. I just would have never known any of that, and he's done so well on his job. He's done well on his job. Well, that's good. Now, I hope you can do as well on your job. What are you going to do to control this man? Okay. Ms. Wheeler, the way I see it, we both have problems. Okay, I have the problem with Jim and his possible untruths, okay, but you also have a problem with your daughter because so we need to control this factor, okay. I'm going to take care of Jim. I'm going to do some investigation into this matter because this is, this is very serious. This is definitely a, a violation of his parole and he can go back to prison for this. But I also want to ask you, do you think you can do anything about controlling your daughter seeing Jim? Well, I don't know. I've already talked to her once. I mean, she is 16 years old. I've explained the situation to her, and I told her not to be hanging around with him, and she told me she wouldn't, but she's still doing it anyway. He still comes to the house, and she runs out to see him and jumps on the back of that motorcycle, and he takes her down the road. What am I supposed to do, go out and chase the motorcycle down the road like a mad dog? Well, no, I don't think that's necessary, but I think maybe you can talk to your daughter again and tell her that you've been to see me, and maybe... You know, you can just have a discussion about how maybe it wouldn't be to her best benefit to see Jim again. Oh, we'll have another discussion. I had a discussion with her before. I took a st stick to her to get her attention a couple times and told her to knock it off. If I have to, I will lock her in her room to keep her from seeing this man. Well, Miss Willie, that's pretty serious. That's a form of child abuse, and you can go to prison yourself for that. Child abuse? Yes. They call that child abuse? Yes, they do. Well, I'll find some way to stop it that nobody can call child abuse then. That's my part of it. I will do that part of my job. I want to make sure you do something about this, too. Okay. Ms. Wheeler, I am going to take care of this. I'm going to investigate the matter. I'm going to talk to Jim. And uh, if by chance I find out that these things that you're saying that he's doing, he is doing, then that is a violation. He will definitely go back to prison for this. Well, I'll tell you what. You better be telling me the absolute truth because i got friends that know people. My cousin works in the governor's office, and if you don't do what you said you're going to do, I'm going to put a call in. Okay. Ms. Willard, to satisfy you and to let you know that we are doing our job, I'm going to investigate. I'm going to talk to Jim. And after this, I will call you back in the office. We'll talk about it. And if you're not satisfied then, I'll call my supervisor, let her come in here and explain the procedure we go through when we're checking out someone's records and we find that they have been violating their parole. And then if you're not satisfied, then fine. You can call the governor or whoever you know, and but you let them know that we have done our part. Now, are you satisfied with that? You mean you're actually going to do something? Yes, I am. I'm you going really to investigate. Are? Yes, I am. Well, yeah, as long as you do your job, I'll do mine with Cindy Ann, and neither one of us will give each other a headache anymore. Okay. And you're satisfied with what I said? Well, at this point, as long as you follow through on it, yes. 
Okay, I will follow through and I'll call you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Class, I'd like to most sincerely congratulate you for an outstanding job. You deserve a grade, each and every one of you. Uh, it's way beyond my fondest expectations. Now we have a few minutes, I understand, for us to have a round-robin critique. Suppose we start and give your comments about your experience and uh, if there's any uh, underpinning of a theoretical nature for what you did or for what you heard, and if you want to make any critique and perhaps live through it about the other members of the class, go ahead. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, the thing that we studied this semester was one of the main points of emphasis was reality therapy, which is um, taught by Dr. Glasser, who's one of Dr. Batson's friends and professional friends. And what reality therapy involves is getting down and writing out a contract between the parole officer or the counselor and the inmate. And what we did in our session was we, we wrote out a contract. And one of the main things is, is to do that, to make sure that both ends of the bargain are met I think that was met in our, me and Mike's session. And I think everybody else did a fantastic job. And that's all I have to say. Can I just make one comment about this uh, particular portion? Uh, I thought the prospect of going to AA could be made just a little bit more attractive. And actually, it's a fun experience that he probably will enjoy it very much. And that during an open meeting, he, he can even bring his wife down. And you can tell him perhaps that from past experience, those people that have started going to AA at first, they didn't like it, and to expect that he wouldn't like it. But once he gets to know the people and the fine brand of coffee they serve, he'll start <laughs> enjoying it, and it'll be a very pleasant experience. And you can predict that he will someday thank you for introducing him to AA. But all in all, you did a fine job. Um, what I'd like to say first, in our particular segment, it was dealing with... Uh, conflict resolution and what I had was a belligerent woman uh, very very angry and my position was to a make her feel comfortable let her know that she was needed and that we were going to take care of the particular problem that she had and uh, I also like to say as far as the group is concerned that I think everyone did well I have no complaint about this section of the presentation at all I think it was handled delicately it's a difficult situation uh, a wrong statement can result in, in a real eruption of very bad feelings and very bad feedback for the agency. You handled it very well. I want to congratulate you. And you, dear, was excellent as a distraught mother. A true irritation. Yes. 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 If I may comment on that segment with Michelle, it's, it's very difficult when you deal with someone who's constantly hurling accusations at you and making you feel you are responsible for everything that happens and not saying to them there's the door hit it jack or something like that or accusing them back and inflaming them is very difficult i've been in a situation myself i know it's hard not to tell them what to do with themselves and to go away you did very well because it's a tough situation and if it's not handled properly you might be hearing from the governor and as far as everyone else's performance goes very good. I was real pleased. Joel, I've got to tell you that I received a complaint that perhaps the credit for the idea should go here. <laughs> rather than just, but we'll work that out later. Okay. What's your reaction? <laughs> well, I wanted to say something about that, too. Uh, the idea of the film was a class idea uh, as a whole. Uh, and I just took it further to try and get as good a product as possible for the entire class and for the conference. But uh, in truth, Michelle was the first one to mention uh, trying to film and doing this as a class project, something that would be lasting, and uh, I think truly yeah, and that's can, what we've done. I can add, I don't remember enjoying a class project as much as I did this one. Good. We're, we're very happy to hear you say that. Yes, very. <laughs> Especially when it comes to grades. Only yeah. one with some great times. Yes. Do <laughs> you want to make any comments about, about your Now, in our segment uh, on I'm going to commit suicide, we also did this on the reality therapy model. And uh, we didn't get to quite develop it as much as possible, but part of reality therapy is uh, there are like seven principles, some of them involvement, a focus on current behavior, the patient or parolee, whatever, uh, evaluating his behavior, making a plan for responsible behavior, uh, 
focusing on the here and now and the future and how you go about uh, making some effective change uh, in what has been happening with you in terms of looking down the road. And uh, I think that's what we tried to do in the I'm Going to Commit Suicide show that you can make a plan. The plan doesn't necessarily work like magic. You have some problems, you have to keep working at it. If the, pro if the plan does not work as you first uh, drew it up, uh, you go ahead and attack the problem again. You don't give up, you persevere. As we tried to show in there, part of reality therapy is commitment and uh, persevering and uh, giving your best shot. And if it doesn't work, well, you regroup and try it again. My feeling about that section was that uh, you did show a sensitivity to suicide as the possible base for a malpractice suit in the millions of dollars these days. There have been a number of such incidents. So you took it very seriously, and I noticed that at the end you made sure that all points were covered by taking him to the supervisor, which I thought was particularly appropriate in this kind of situation these days. All right. Well, I knew that if, this, if he was going to commit suicide and I let him out of my office, I could have gotten in so much trouble. I could have lost my job, first of all. A whole lot of things could have happened. So I had to cover my own self to make sure that this wouldn't happen. And uh, that was, well, and one thing, we, we went through our, our thing with the idea of reality therapy as our theory, but we were talking earlier that assertive, assertive training is an area that this particular thing could have been taken, that theory could have been used and in a way, um, if you notice, some of the dialogue did relate to assertion training with uh, dealing with the, uh, the person, with dealing with his feelings about himself, trying to make him feel better about himself, and in turn making him feel better about himself becomes more assertive. Last but not least. Well, in our case, the case of the home drinker, I think it was important to uh, emphasize the fact